Welcome back to the Speaking and Communicating Podcast. I am your host, Roberta. If you are looking to improve your communication skills, both professionally and personally, this is the podcast you should be tuning into. And by the end of this episode, please remember to subscribe, give a rating and a review. Now, not only do we discuss communication skills in on this podcast, but we also focus on leadership and how collaboration will always trump competition. My guest today, hailing, hailing all the way from Australia, down under, Peter Anthony from Peter Anthony Consulting. He is a leadership coach based in Sydney. He, works, he has worked in 12 countries and he has conducted over thousands of collaboration workshops is here to talk to us today about how the type of conversations you have can literally change both your professional and your business life. And before I go any further, please help me to welcome him to the show. Hi, Peter. G'day, Roberta. G'day, folks from Sydney, Australia. Welcome to you all the way from Chicago, Power of Technology. <laughs> Glad to have wow. you on the show. <laughs> I've worked I've worked in Chicago, Roberta. When I was there, it was extremely cold. Which Very it is short. now, actually. You can see how I'm dressed. <laughs> I worked with um I worked with uh two companies there. One was um mm. SC Johnson, the second was Wrigley. Okay. Uh, in Chicago. Yeah. yeah. I was there, I was there in winter, which is our summer, and I've never experienced anything so cold. You don't have the best timing when it comes to being weather to come here for sure. <laughs> so, Peter, welcome and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, as as you mentioned, Roberta, I'm a professional coach. Um, I've worked in twelve countries over a long period of time, run thousands of workshops on, on collaboration. As you can probably tell, and I've, I've told you already, I'm from Sydney, Australia. Um, I love where I work and love where I live, and. One thing I did this morning, which I do most mornings, was I jump into the ocean and swim with my friends for a couple of Ks each morning. It's the best way to wake up at about 6 a.m., dive into the ocean. Uh, hopefully it's around dawn time. You see the sun rising over the ocean. You get some exercise. You get to be in nature and uh, you get to hang out with your friends. So it's the best way to start the day. Wow. A five-hour swim? Five hours. Did I say five hours? No, 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 no not five hours. No, it's a couple of kilometers. Oh, it's a okay. Couple of kilometers. <laughs> couple of yeah, kilometers. Not, not five hours. No, oh. it, it, it takes about 40 minutes or so. We swim, mm. if anyone knows Manly Beach, we swim up from the southern end of Manly Beach straight out through the surf. And we turn right to Shelley Beach. We stop right. there, then we swim back again. Oh, very uh, it's, it's called the It's called the Bold and Beautiful Swim Club. They should and turn it into a soap it, opera. <laughs> <laughs> it, was named, it was named by the lady that started it because she loved the Bold and Beautiful uh, soap series or soap show mm. and uh she started it about 11 years ago and now it's got uh, close to 8,000 members and we've had we've had some friends from america join us like often when people visit manly they'd like to have a swim they, they join our squad wow it sounds really fun yeah. so how did you get so, into leadership question i said go ahead i was going to say if you ever get down to, to manly roberta you're welcome to join us for sure uh, for a swim <laughs> I hail from Durban, which is on the Indian Ocean of South Africa. So I grew up around the ah, ocean. Yes. Okay. Yes. Lots of sure. South Africans in Australia. Lots of them here. I, I feel like you guys are our second home kind of thing. A lot of South Africans, if they move countries, it's most likely going to be the UK or Australia. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, that, that's true. I think it's just, mm. it's like a direct, uh, direct east flight. A lot of uh, South Africans in Perth. And a, a lot in uh, in city too, which is terrific. We actually swim with a couple. There's there's two in my group. There's a, a South African and uh, a Rhodesian, actually. Yeah, Rhodesian. Right guy. from Zimbabwe. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah from Z Zimbabwe. Sorry, Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit of, about how you got into leadership coaching. Well, I I I began my career in, in advertising and spent a, a dozen or so years making big brand ads. And I wanted to work more closely in uh, in leadership uh, and uh, and sales leadership uh, in particular. And uh, I transitioned uh, into consulting, and I found that uh, what we were teaching then, and the firm that I was working for then, was teaching traditional selling. And 
what I found was was two really surprising things. Uh, one was that the more I tried to sell, the less I sold. And when I was in workshops teaching people these influencing and sales skills, they just didn't resonate. They didn't work. And, and they didn't work for me and for them for a couple of reasons. One was that when people feel like you're selling to them, they get into a buyer mode. And when they're in a buyer mode, they tend to get cynical. They tend to distance themselves in terms of relationship from you. And they put downward pressure on, on fees and prices. So it just wasn't working. And this was my living. And uh, I was, that began me on a journey of understanding, well, if selling doesn't work, what does? And I, I went back to university, did a master's in communication to study this more closely okay. and looked at some uh, some collaboration uh, strategies uh, from around the world. Uh, uh, people like uh, Rachel Butzman, who predicted the rise of Uber and Airbnb in the collaborative economy and looked at uh, collaboration from a cultural point of view and sort of organisations that were most constructive and collaborate, collaborative in their cultures were the ones that were most successful and had the most profitable growth. And then I thought, can we translate this at the conversation level? Like, would collaboration translate down to a conversation as opposed to just a strategy? Because at the end of the day, your strategy gets executed through the conversations that you have. So I began developing uh, what is now what I call Collaboradabra, which rhymes with Abracadabra or the magic of a collaborative conversation. Right. Uh, and uh, over a period of time, I developed these six moments that matter. I was teaching it in workshops live, so I knew what was working and what wasn't uh, with participants that I had. And uh, fortunately, uh, it worked really well. Mm. So first of all, what you touched on, we always say we like buying, but we don't want to be sold to. Yes, yes, yes. So how yeah. do we Everyone get around that? Buy. Because you, yes, we want to buy. So why are we giving you, the salesperson, such a hard time? Because eventually we do want to buy. I, I think I think what we want is uh, we want to buy, but we want to buy in a relationship. Mm. And it's interesting. Uh, I've seen a lot of research on on uh, how customers feel because one of the things uh, I do when I'm working with an organisation is to research what customers are looking for, looking for what an ideal relationship looks like at the customer level. And when you look at uh, what uh, what customers are looking for from organisations. Uh, uh, the number one thing they're after is a unique understanding of my needs and my environment. So uniquely understand me. And if you look at uh, a, a leadership uh, conversation is no different than a conversation you have in any other relationship. Uh, and uh, one of your compatriots in Washington State University, John Gottman, looked at this very closely in romantic relationships. And he found that he could predict the four horsemen of the apocalypse in terms of a relationship just based on videoing a conversation between a couple. So the quality of the relationship was the quality of the conversations. And that's the same in a, in a commercial relationship or a leadership uh, relationship. It's not about being sold to. It's about uniquely understanding someone's needs in their environment, which is what they're looking for, and leave them better off as a result of the relationship or conversation with you because what I've found is a relationship is simply a series of conversations okay. and it might start with nothing uh, and then it, it can build into something quite spectacular and leaders in particular need to think about this because leadership is a journey it, it's not something that you you do in a week or a month or even a year no. it's, it's a lifelong journey and you want to develop those relationships and the way that you do that is by giving people collaborative outcomes you achieving what you want them achieving what they want, and then that collaborative conversation feeds up into a more collaborative, constructive culture. Mm -hmm. Is that the reason you call marketing professionals CEOs, which is chief emotions officers? <laughs> That's right. It, yeah, they're in charge of the emotion. They're in charge of, of, of the emotion of the brand or the emotion of the relationship uh, between the organization uh, and the consumers, like whether it's a business to business relationship or a business to, uh, to consumer relationship, uh, a, a brand is simply a manifestation of, of how the buyers want to feel. Mm. Uh, and the more relevant that brand is, uh, the more the consumers are willing to pay for what you're selling to them. I mean, I, I've worked with a lot of big 
consumer goods organizations. And one of the biggest I worked with was a, a maker of tissue products like facial tissues. And they made like high branded tissues. And they also made like the, the no label cheap and cheerful tissues, same box, same tissues, same prints, same scent, made in the same factory from the same trees. But if it's branded in a relevant way, uh, consumers are willing to pay a lot more. And that's what I learned from my years of advertising, to, to look at building brands in a way that was relevant to the consumer that made them uh, sticky, if you like, so they, they kept purchasing and they're willing to pay a premium for that brand experience. Now, leadership and communication and conversation is no different. Um, if, yeah. I've, if I have a close relationship with somebody, uh, that's of value to me. And I want to invest in that because because they're investing in me too. It's 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 a very similar sort of strategy that we're after. And I, I can't stress that strongly enough that, uh, that leaders are collaborators. That is true. We always emphasize leadership, the higher you go, the less the technical work you learned at university and more the, the relationships, the collaborations, the communication skills, the soft skills. Can you just exactly. share with us your experiences on that? Absolutely. Uh, um, one of the things I look at uh, very closely, Roberta, is psychometrics. Like if I'm working with a leader, I like to do a psychometric profile um, of them. And the model I use is, you know, comes from an organization called Lumina Learning. And we look at, say, for example, uh, polarities like outcome focus and people focus. And often leaders, when they're young, uh, they're more outcome focused. They're more about getting an outcome, like getting a sales outcome, getting a business outcome, getting a share price, whatever it might be, uh, particularly uh, young entrepreneurs. However, as they develop through their careers, they, they get a lot more people focused. It's not about dropping the outcome focus. It's about being outcome focused and people focused. Mm -hmm. And by people focused, um, I'm talking about things like traits like uh, collaboration, empathy, and intimacy. Intimacy is the one-on-one -on -one relationships you get from conversations. Collaboration is obviously your ability to work with uh, individuals and teams to create a better outcome than the people uh, could by themselves. And empathy is about demonstrating that you understand how people feel, uh, not just feeling how they feel or knowing how they feel, but demonstrating that. And when a leader can demonstrate that uh, two people or people feel like, hey, she understands me or he understands me, that creates a more an environment of authentic trust. And that's what you can build an organization around because you can attract high quality people and keep them and grow them with you. Mm -hmm. And they certainly grow if you give them that room of first you have the relationship and also they will thrive and you bring the best out of them, so to speak, exactly. if you have that exactly. relationship. So the outcomes, like you said, are actually going to be better. Exactly, exactly. And all the good research on, on teams, Roberta, as I'm, I'm sure you've seen mm -hmm. um, from people like James Starecki and the Wisdom of Crowds and many other studies uh, since then. Uh, what they've found is that um, a well-formed, diverse team makes a smarter decision than its smartest member. So again, it echoes that, that collaboration idea. So diversity isn't just good um, ethically. Uh, it's also just good business sense to get a diverse team together and help them collaborate in a way that makes them achieve better outcomes than they could by themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's the essence of, of profitable growth. Yes, collaborating. And when you think of how, if you have your just your perspective, that's just one perspective, but you have more, it, it it's yeah. gonna increase the, it, it's gonna broaden the, the perspective and you're gonna create that customer experience in a much better, bigger way, rather than just the exactly. one perspective. Exactly, exactly. I was in the, back in the UK again, working in June of this year. And uh, one of my colleagues showed me some research of, uh, publicly listed uh, organizations in the UK. These are the the, uh, the, the, the companies on the stock exchange in the UK. Mm. And uh, they compared the uh, the share price or equity growth over a decade, uh, and they compared it uh, or correlated that with how diverse the board was. And the interesting correlation was the more diverse the board was, the more they had uh, more equity growth that organization experienced. Wow. So it's it's just it's just good business sense, right? To, to have multiple perspectives in how decisions made, which it is more about team collaboration mm -hmm. uh, than about like one on one collaboration. It's the same idea. 
Mm -hmm. So let's talk about Colabra the magic of Colabra. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love, it always makes me laugh. I, th I think Ebra, Colabra, Colabra, Ebra. Yeah, yeah I, the, the idea. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Abra, Abra, Yeah, the idea came. I was working on collaboration for many years, and I was, th I was thinking. I kept thinking, "There's real. When you get this right, there's a real magic to it. It's a, mm. it's like uh, listening to people talking about how they wrote songs. There's like the, a magic. You hear it here. That, that's that's the song. That's the lyric. Uh, that's the that's the combination of notes or chords I need to make this make this really harmonious. And I thought that's that's the same with with conversations and we know when it feels right and only you know how mm -hmm. it feels I, I can't tell you how you feel but when it feels right you think yeah there's a magic about this and I thought magic abracadabra collaboradabra uh yeah. and that, that was like that became the that became the uh the name of the approach if you like uh and the approach uh I developed has three intentions if you like or three mindsets to it and six moments that matter uh, in that conversation, uh, and uh, it's it's important to be thinking about these things, particularly now because the Apple research says that we've been having the Apple have been researching uh, like telephone calls because originally a phone was about calling people, right? Yes. Now, now it's like less than ten percent of the time people spend on their phones is making calls. It's been it's been falling consistently since two thousand six. Oh. I think it's crazy to call it a phone. It's not a phone. Do <laughs> people even a, do that like anymore? <laughs> we don't call each other. And that they found that the the number of the number of calls has fallen, mm -hmm. and also the the length of the conversations is shortening. So you less less calls, they're shorter. And the Pew research out of the US just recently suggested that we've never been less likely to change our minds as a result of a conversation. We've never been more polarized. Oh. In, in how we think and how we feel and what we believe mm. and, and that's really concerning for me because I, I think that's one of the reasons there's been a, a, a correlated rise in like anxiety and depression and sadness and introversion uh, right across the and world and the fights you um, witness on social media all these strangers yeah, being keyboard warriors because you we don't know how yeah. to have conversations anymore no, we don't. We don't. We think we are. We think we're having conversations because we're texting people, or on Snapchat, or on Facebook, or whatever your whatever your favorite platform is. Uh, and texting isn't a conversation. And what I guess is also concerning is that if you're on a social media platform like, say, TikTok, uh, for example, or or any social media platform, what the algorithm does is it feeds you back what you already know and like. So all it's really doing is reinforcing your biases. Like, say, for example, I'm mm -hmm. a surfer and an ocean swimmer. So if I'm on TikTok, all I'm going to get is ocean swimming and surfing. I think, wow, TikTok's full of ocean swimming and surfing. Uh, I've got three daughters. If I look at their TikTok, their TikTok is very different than my, than my TikTok. It's just I'm reinforcing sure. the point of view. <laughs> I'm sure. It, I'm, and I hope it is. I hope yeah. it is. Uh, and it's it's concerning. It, it uh, I get concerned because I think it's not making us happier as individuals and it's also uh making us less effective as as uh, business leaders and potential leaders because we haven't got the skills required to build the collaborative culture required to get the great business results that we're looking for that's right and also like you said so you get stuck in your beliefs and it reinforces it the other exactly. thing that happens yeah. is then you don't know how to open up your mind to a new idea and how to be open to the fact that your idea might need tweaking or even a complete new perspective. Exactly, exactly. And that's one of the reasons I like listening to a diverse range of podcasts because I hear different things, different perspectives mm. uh, on, on the world. Uh, and uh, it keeps it, I attempt to practice what I preach to hear different things, different perspectives and hear their point of view and try and understand it because it opens up my mind and it's uh, the only way to live. Mm -hmm. And speaking of different points of view, talking about leadership, since we're both in leadership coaching, we have now we are now in a situation where you have global teams in different parts of the world. There's different cultures yeah. in the same team. So as a leader, how do you become sensitive to these different cultures and embracing them and making the other team members feel like they're part of the team 
while also keeping keeping the company work culture intact. Yes, that's a, that's a great question. That's like that's like the muddy question of of, of culture. Uh, you and I just talked uh, before we started the podcast, Roberta, about working in different countries and different cultures, and uh, we've both done that. And uh, my experience has been that um, it creates another level of complexity because the people that you're working with are applying a different lens to the same environment. Uh, and what, one example I'll give you is that I've done a lot of work in Asia, clearly, like Australia is almost in the middle of Asia. Right. It's the first place we get to work-wise. So mm-hmm. places like China, Singapore, Japan, South Korea, India, uh, they're all very different cultures uh, of and by themselves. And one interesting thing I found when I first started working in China was I thought, wow, these people are so introverted that they're so... They just don't speak up. They they don't uh, give an opinion. What I realised, though, was they were just waiting to feel enough trust uh, to open up. And when they mm. opened up, they were extremely extroverted. But they started off introverted. and but but When uh, they feel I, safe. I, I, they, they feel safe when they're introverted. Yes. And, and I get that. I get that completely. Mm. Uh, but I used to, I'd run workshops like in Beijing and Shanghai and uh, I'd start I'd start the workshop in a, in a what I thought was an engaging way, and all I saw was like you know eight stone faces looking back at me, thinking, "Wow, this is not great." Uh, but what I found was by the end of the day, they were friendly, they were chatty, they were engaging. We had dinner that night, and they they told great stories. Now, this this is really really curious. Whereas other cultures I go to, mm-hmm. uh, it's a lot more open, a lot more quickly. Like if if I go to a culture, if I work in say uh, Los Angeles or I work in Texas like in Austin or Dallas, mm. you know, a lot more open, a lot more quickly. Uh, and it, but that's that's a different level of a different level of culture. So as a leader, uh, it's about recognizing those different um, types of cultures uh, and finding a way to engage them all, which gets back to that idea of that wisdom of the crowd. If you mm-hmm. can do that, I mean, why bother doing that? Because you're going to get a smarter decision when you're not – not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do as well. Right. Yes. So the six moments, the six key moments from the book that make collaboration six moments that matter. magic. <laughs> six moments that matter. Six moments that uh, matter. Yes. <laughs> six moments. So you think about a conversation, you think, okay, well, why am I so hard on conversations? Well, because it is the essence of a relationship, as I mentioned earlier. The six moments that matter. The first moment is before the conversation takes place. When you make a decision about uh, or you reflect about what's going to be different at the end of this conversation for both of us. Uh, so you're looking at setting a goal or an outcome for the conversation. Not your outcome, our outcome. Something that's good for both of us. Mm. And you're looking at changing either how someone's thinking, like changing their thinking, like educating them or introducing them to a new way of thinking about something. You're changing uh, what they're doing, like changing their behavior in some way. If you're a leader, you might want to implement a, a new a new CRM system or a new procedure in the organization. Or importantly, we often forget is changing how they feel, mm-hmm. uh, like helping them feel more comfortable or more confident uh, in your leadership. Because in this case, you're thinking, well, Leadership is really about generating followership. You can't command people to follow you. I guess if you're the CEO, you could just say, follow me or you're out. That's not going to last. Otherwise, no paycheck for you. Yeah. (laughs) No, there's no paycheck for you. You're out. That's not going to last a a long time. So the first one is setting a goal, thinking about, okay, this is for every conversation you have. Even when I um, I visited my mum, she's passed away now. But I remember I used to uh, visit her quite regularly uh, on every Saturday morning. That was my um, my morning. I'd go for a surf, have a swim, visit my mum. Mm. And I, I used to think before I saw her, I thought, wow, uh, how can I make her feel treasured in the time that I have with her? Wow. So that uh, at, at least she can, she can feel like really, really treasured. Uh, and how much can I... Uh, thank her for the way that she raised me and what, what a great mum she was mm-hmm. for me. It can be personal. It can be the same in a romantic relationship. Like um, I'm, I'm taking my wife away uh, for a holiday uh, in January. And I'm thinking, uh, how can I make her feel like a, a really treasured wife? How can I make her feel loved mm. uh, during this time away? And you think you think like that, and you're just acting differently because you're changing you're changing what the goal is. Right. In a business sense, it, it's exactly the same. 
uh, how can I change how this person is thinking, feeling, or what, what they're doing uh, that leaves us both better off? That's moment number one before the conversation takes place. So you just killed moment all of us women's goal of winning the argument. <laughs> Kidding, number two, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh, well, I, but, uh, Roberta, I'm, I live in a family of, uh, of three daughters, two sons and a wife. Mm. Uh, I get I get a lot of female feedback. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I get a lot of a lot, <laughs> good a luck. lot of advice. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I get I get lots of advice. Uh, every night at dinner, I get I get advice. Every morning, mm -hmm. I get advice. It's it's great having so wow. many advisors collaborating. <laughs> collaborating. Well, attempting to attempting to. Right. Uh, it's it's a, a very cool. I mean, I love it. I, I love them. It's a cool household to. Um, to be hanging out in. Yes, that's so, wonderful. Mm. All right, sorry, let's get back to number two. I interrupted you. <laughs> <laughs> that's the first, that's that moment number one. Yeah. That, that's number one. Uh, no, number two is relating. Uh, and this is where uh, you're doing two things uh, when you're relating. Uh, this is about saying, no, the first one is you're getting present mm -hmm. or mindful, which I'm sure your listeners are aware of, getting very present and very mindful. And once you're, present you give the gift of your presence to the person that you're with and the way that i think about this is you listen until you disappear so you completely disappear and you give them your full attention and this is extremely rare i mean when we do this in workshops people feel uncomfortable with it because it's 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 unusual to feel like someone's giving you their full attention uh, but then you can then you can uh the rapport builds automatically i mean there's a lot of old school thinking about rapport when you adjust your style to suit theirs and deliberately mm -hmm. match them the mirror them all stuff uh what happens is that if you give them your attention and give them your presence uh subconsciously you'll automatically begin adjusting to suit their style and they'll feel comfortable and what you'll find is that when you're willing and able to give uh your attention to them they're more willing and able to potentially change their point of view or change how they feel for you but you've got to go first you right. can't expect them to go first they feel yeah. validated. Mm. That, that they feel like they're there. Mm. They feel like they're there and they feel like they're being listened to. Right. And if you get back to that original thought um, we talked about a, a couple of minutes ago, when people are saying, or uh, from leaders uh, and from organisations, I want someone who uniquely understands my needs and my environment. That, that's when the understanding starts is when you first meet them. Okay. Then you'll adjust to suit their style. I mean, some... Some people, some senior clients I meet, they get straight to business, click, click, click. Others want a bit more personal rapport first. You, you, you work with whatever's going to work best for them. Mm -hmm. That's moment two. Okay. Moment number three. Moment number three is to take the lead. This is not leading in a dominant way, but as a leader in a conversation or leader in an organization, uh, you need to give the conversation some structure. And you're doing that by answering four primary questions like why is the conversation taking place mm -hmm. from from their perspective and from a joint perspective what outcome are we looking for together uh what's the best way uh, or how do we go about achieving that in the time we have together in this conversation and finally so what's next so how does this the result of this conversation fit into an overall relationship so it's not like just a one-off it's you're building a commitment curve uh, mm -hmm. You're constantly building commitment and building relationship with each conversation uh, that you have. So I might say something like, if if I was meeting with you, Roberta, like for this podcast, I might say, well, g'day, Roberta. Uh, it's great to meet you. Look, the reason we're getting together is to is to create a, a high quality podcast for listeners and, and give them some value. Yes. Uh, and 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 by the end of the uh, and how I thought we could do that is you can ask me some questions I'll give you the best answers I can and we can uh, we can create some value for listeners so that after the uh, after our conversation we can both feel happy that we've we've done a great job and people have got some value from the experience of listening to us okay. and, and oh that's that only takes about a minute it just sets up the conversation it's not about me or you it's it's about us creating something of value and ideally a pro-social outcome so other people are better off as a result of us having this conversation or this relationship. Right. That's that's moment three. Does that make sense? It does. It certainly does. And I feel like this yeah. one, it, it almost like it ties it. The first one was the goal. This one is yeah, saying, yeah. how do we get to number one? How do we get to the goal? Yeah. How do we mm. do that? And 
And it, it's not telling, it's just suggesting. And ideally, yes. oh, well, very likely, you might have an exchange of emails or an exchange of notes before the conversation takes place. It's rare you have a completely cold conversation with somebody. That's possible. Mm-hmm. So you might have done some of this in setting up the conversation to begin with. And right. if you want to attract uh, a better, more effective leadership and, and, and more senior people to talk to, give them a bigger why. That's what Simon Sinek so famously said. Start with the why. Give them a big reason why the conversation is taking place from their mm-hmm. perspective and from yours. That's okay. moment three. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Number four. We're halfway we, there. We're number four. Number four is my favorite. Mm. Number four. And that, that's understanding. Understanding them. Uh, and I'm, I'm taking, I'm borrowing an idea here from Stephen Covey in his Seven Habits of Highly Effective People when he said, seek first to understand before seeking to be understood. So you need to understand how they're thinking, not globally about everything in their life, but understand how they're thinking about the topic you're discussing in that conversation, no matter what it might be. It could be you're changing a board member or looking to employ a new sales director or HR director, anything at all in that conversation. You think this person has either conscious or subconscious decision-making criteria they're using to make that decision. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're going to influence that decision or attempt to uh, create a decision together, the, you need to understand how they're thinking about that already. And there's four different parts of this. This is you want to understand what their decision-making values are, like what's important to them. Like you might say, hey, Roberta, if, you, if, I, if I was selling you a car, I might say, hey, Roberta, what's most important to you in buying a car? Reliability, like, safe. Re- doesn't child gas reliable. too much because it's expensive. <laughs> it's reliable, like it's safe, and it's it's not too expensive. Economically, get, yeah. Economically, yeah, fantastic. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, I might say then, so Roberta, which one of those is the most? Imp- How would you rank those? Did you give them to me in order? Reliability, safety, not too expensive. Is that like the order you put them in? Uh, yeah, actually, yes, that is number one, two, three. Because reliable, I don't want to be stuck in the middle of nowhere <laughs> just because something is yeah, yeah. is not working. Yes, I need to get yeah, home. I tell you what, if you were, I was in, uh, I was in Queensland in Australia working recently, and I was working for, a, uh, I won't say who it was, a very large mining organisation, and we were driving between uh, mines, and sometimes we were driving for ninety minutes, two hours at a time, on roads that were dead straight with uh, no no mobile phone reception, uh, and not and not passing any other cars. See what a reliable car you're doing back to You don't down. want to be stuck there. Yeah. Nobody's going to help you. <laughs> can't so call AAA, a, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or well, AAA, exactly. You can't call them because there's no mobile phone reception. Exactly. <laughs> middle, 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 of the, middle of the country. Right. So, okay, so I've, I've got your criteria. I've got what rank they're, what order they're in. Then I might say, because we, we, we know we think neuro-linguistically. So when you say reliable, I've got a definition of reliable in my head that I yes. think that's what reliable means, right? And I'll assume that you think it's the same that I think, which is very unlikely, right? So I, I ask the third the third thing I need to understand is what does that mean? So I'd say something like, hey, Roberta, when you say reliable, what does reliability mean for you? What, what does it mean? You'd say what? I don't want to be stuck in the middle of nowhere. I want to make sure every time I drive this car, I get home safely. Yeah, or exactly. To my destination so it's, safe. it's, not gonna, yeah. it's it's not it's not going to break down. It's not mm. going to break down. And 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 I would do the same for each of those criteria. I'd ask you what does safe mean. Mm-hmm. That's going to mean different things. I mean, some, for some people, particularly Australians, safety means a big car. It means big. And big is safe, right? Wow. Other people, it's smaller. Uh, other people, it's European is safe. Other people, Volvos are safe. I mean, it can vary, right? It, hugely. Mm. Uh, and not too expensive. Well, well, that's the money question, isn't it? Like, well, what's too ex- I'm not going to ask you this, but I'd ask be asking, well, what's too expensive for you? Like, what, what does that mean? Uh, to, what does expensive, because I'm, I'm now I'm getting a feel for how you're thinking money-wise, right. what's sort of investment you, you can afford to make or want to make in a car. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'll say, I'll, I'll say I, since I under- it depreciates, you know, I don't want it to be, uh, guess mileage, things like maintenance and service, it shouldn't cost a fortune. Yeah. 
Yeah, it doesn't cost it doesn't cost a fortune. And then I'd be so what's a fortune for you? I'd be really curious. See, here it's it's like you're really curious, and again, you're still disappearing. I, I'm not um attempting to force my criteria onto you. I'm really curious about your criteria and like being mm. like an almost an investigative journalist to be very curious and really understand. And oftentimes people don't know what their criteria are because we're oper operating on like an autopilot if you like, and we don't always know. Well, there could have been criteria you had when you bought a car five years ago. That might have changed now. Changed, yeah. I mean, uh, I happened um, to drive a, a BMW motor car. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like a luxury branded car. But one of the main reasons I bought BMW was that when I started first started working with senior leaders many years ago, um, I drove a Mazda, which was a great car. I loved mm -hmm. it. Big family car, a lot, lots of kids, which is pretty handy. And I parked it in the in the uh, in the car park of uh, of a CEO, and uh, he came down. And he said, "What are you doing driving a Mazda?" And I said, well, "It's a great car, very reliable." And he said, "Look, you can't come and park in executive car parks with a Mazda. You've got to have a, a European car. You've got to get Mercedes or BMW, right?" <laughs> that, that was his. That was his thinking. <laughs> And one of the main reasons I went BMW was was to park in the in the corporate car spaces with the senior execs that I was coaching. It looked like yeah. I was one of them to keep your business uh, and that, intact. That was, yeah, and that was that was high on my criteria. Now, not many mm. people buy a car for where they're going to park it, <laughs> right? <laughs> but it, it was that the was, outcome yeah. was your business and your clientele must be yeah you need you need to retain your clientele which is understandable yes exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. you, you, you've got to you've got to look like them you've got to you've got to look right. like you belong in that in that club if you like mm -hmm. um, so that was one of my and um, my, my wife laughed when I told her that argument <laughs> she thought it was hilarious but, but but I won that one right which is not like me but I won that one. Uh, so that's that's why I've got that car. But then the, the final part of understanding you want to uh, get to is what do you want to do most to avoid? Like what you, what are you most concerned about here? And you want to get into their fears. I mean, you want to understand what they don't want and then attempt to make your recommendation not what they don't want if that's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you package that together, then you're going to make a recommendation, which is moment number five. Ideally, your recommendation fits with what it is that uh, what the, those values are, or it's not, and it's okay if it's not. That, that's that's quite okay because there's more than enough there's more than enough recommendations you can make with people that agree with them, without attempting to force or lie or be dishonest or disingenuous about what you're recommending. Yeah. So you're recommending a solution that fits their criteria, or you're recommending um, how they might want to think about changing their criteria. Uh, okay. because something's new, something's different, you've got special knowledge, you, you can introduce a different perspective, which may be of value, not to you, but to them. Uh -huh. Then you've finally got the, the final moment, which is the agreeing moment where you get to agree uh, and you make the recommendation. They're going to say yes, no, or maybe. Yes is a great answer. No is a better answer. I love no's, not because I like conquering no's, but because... If it's an honest no, I like that because we're not going to waste each other's time attempting to find something that's not there. Uh -huh. I'm not going to lie to you. You're not going to lie to me. And too often I see people pretending to agree when they don't really. That's uh, worse, actually. I prefer the no in that instance as well. Yeah. It's yeah. annoying in our business, uh, Roberta, when yeah. clients might pretend to agree with you or pretend they're going to proceed and they don't. I say, like, I'm a big boy. I'm very comfortable with a no. That's quite okay. You know, I'm I'm used to getting those. Um, uh -huh. So that that's that's quite comfortable. So you're going to yes, you're going to no. You're going to maybe. You're going to maybe. You want to use a simple negotiating tool, which is in the book, to help you understand how to translate that maybe into a yes that's worth having for both of you. And that might uh -huh. be just revisiting some of those criteria to see whether we can move them around, like change what the criteria are, change what order they're in, change what they mean or give you more comfort about what it is that you want to avoid. Uh -huh. uh, and, and then we've got a conversation that leaves us both better off. Even if there's no agreement, that's great. That might yes. leave us both better off. And then we've, we've got a, a, an enduring relationship together. Uh -huh. uh, and that, that's, that, that filters up through the organisation in terms of how we, uh, how, we, how we treat each other, how we do things around here. We collaborate. That's our culture. Uh -huh. And that's the six moments. Okay, let's say them one by one, all six in one sentence. I know we have to ask for your social media handles before you go. So the first one okay. is the common so, goal. Um, What's six, the goal six moments all in a row. Um, uh -huh. Set a goal, uh, relate by disappearing, 
take the lead, uh, understand, recommend, and agree. There you go. There's all six. Mm -hmm. There's uh, all the six moments of collaboration. Dabra, uh, I hope I said that correctly. Dabra, it rolls Calabra off the tongue, Dabra. doesn't it, Roberta? <laughs> <laughs> <Calabra Dabra. laughs> and last words of wisdom before you go, Peter, what would you say to our listeners today? Uh, what I'd say, what I'd, say uh, I'd recommend two things. Uh, the first is I would say uh, count the number of conversations you have at work in a day, the one-on-one -on -one conversation you have in a day, and do that for a week. Your average might be three a day, four a day, five a day, whatever it might be. And then the following week, increase that number of conversations by one a day. So if I have like three a day, I'm going to have four. If I have five a day, I'm going to have six. And attempt to have the, the, comp, the extra conversations that you do have, collaborative ones. And I can guarantee your life will change. If you have more conversations, not like 100 more, 1,000 more, just one more a day, one more a day, and you make those conversations collaborative conversations and be de deliberately and obviously a collaborator, watch your life change. Watch your, watch your career, whatever you do, wherever you do it, watch your career explode. Mm -hmm. That would be my recommendation. Words of wisdom from Peter Anthony, all the way from Australia, author of Collaboradabra and a leadership executive coach. Thank you so much, Peter, for being on our show today. Pleasure, Thank guys. Where can you find you on social media before you go? Uh, you can find me, Peter Anthony Consulting. You can find me on the web, on YouTube, on Facebook, Peter Anthony Consulting, or just check out Collaboradabra. Uh -huh. It's the only Collaboradabra in Google. Right. <laughs> you'll find me or you'll, or you'll find the book or you'll find my workshops, or all of the above. Excellent stuff. Thank you so much for being on our show today. Absolute pleasure, guys. Don't forget to subscribe, give a rating and a review, and we'll be with you next time.